Good morning. It is my great pleasure to chair today's keynote speech at the ECB conference on monetary policy, bridging science and practice. Naturally, today's keynote speaker has done just that. She has bridged science and practice. Therefore, I'm very glad to introduce Governor Adriana Kugler, who is going to speak to us today about the global fight against inflation. Adriana has been a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System since September 2023. This followed a distinguished career in research and public policy. After her PhD from Berkeley, where, as we found out yesterday, we briefly overlapped, she became Professor of Economics at Pompeo Fabra, University of Houston, and more recently, Georgetown University, where she's currently on leave. In all those years, Adriana frequently bridged science and practice, including as Chief Economist of the US Department of Labor and as US Executive Director at the World Bank. At the time of her joining the board, the Fed had entered the holding phase of its interest rate cycle. In his Jackson Hole speech of 2023, Chair Powell still focused very much on inflation, while stressing that some softening in labor market conditions seemed necessary to bring inflation sustainably back to 2%. In fact, the performance of the labor market had been remarkable and unusual by historical standards, despite the sharp and synchronized tightening of monetary policy globally. But people started watching out for signs of the labor market to soften. Hence, Adriana's appointment to the Fed board was just logical and came at the right time. Labor markets are at the core of Adriana's research agenda, which includes work assessing the design, impact and effectiveness of labor market institutions, such as unemployment insurance, employment protection, or active labor market programs. Her research on the interactions between migration, labor market institutions, and economic outcomes is particularly timely. She found that countries with less flexible labor markets and more employment protection may, in the end, experience more native job losses in response to immigration. Adriana has also made important contributions to the study of human capital and the impact of vocational training. She analyzed a randomized training program for disadvantaged young people introduced in one of her home countries, Colombia. She found significant effects of the training program, but only for women. One common thread in Adriana's research work is the emphasis of evidence-based policy design with an eye on the balance between economic efficiency and social equity. This approach seems to continue shaping her views as a monetary policy maker. Most importantly, Adriana's expertise has become indispensable as labor market developments are, no, are now front and center in the US monetary policy debate. In a recent speech, she pointed to the remarkable performance of the US labor market after the recovery from the pandemic spike in unemployment with 30 straight months of unemployment at or below 4%, which had not happened since the 1960s, and the resulting decline in wage inequality. Rising labor force participation and immigration, as well as a slowdown in labor demand, helped to bring the labor market more into balance. The most recent labor market data, which caused a strong financial market reaction, an example of how bumpy data can be, posing a challenge to data-dependent central banks. We are very curious to hear how you and your colleagues are navigating these challenges and what we can learn from your experiences. So thank you so much for being with us today, Adriana. The floor is yours. Well, Thank you so much for that very generous introduction, Isabel, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here at the ACB today. Um, as Isabel said, I'm particularly pleased to be here at this year's conference because the theme that you have chosen 
is a theme that indeed permeates throughout my career, both as an academic and as a public servant. And of course, every day, we, as central bankers, must bridge science and practice, drawing on the insights of new data and new findings from research, because the economy and the world are continuously changing. We must do so and put those insights into practice, because everyone in the US, here in Europe, and around the world depends on a healthy and growing economy and depends on policymakers making the right decisions to help keep it that way. But well before I came to the Federal Reserve, I was also, as Isabel mentioned, bridging science and practice. First, as a labor economist, when, for example, I was exploring how employment, productivity, and earnings, too, were influenced by educational attainment and experience, but also by policies. Later, as a chief economist at the Department of Labor, I brought science to bear in carrying out its mission of supporting workers. And as the US representative at the World Bank, economic science was likewise crucial in deciding how to best direct the institution's resources to where they were needed the most. In each of these roles, I have learned a little bit more every time about how to balance rigorous scientific understanding of the problems that people face with real world experiences of those people, which sometimes don't fit so neatly into an economic principle or an economic theorem. Most recently, my colleagues and I on the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC, have been laser focused on the very practical task of how to reduce inflation while keeping employment at its maximum level. As you know, we have a dual mandate at the Federal Reserve. To understand the recent experience of high inflation in the US, it is indeed very helpful to consider how inflation behaved around the world after the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the remainder of my remarks today, I will discuss the global dimensions of the recent bout of high inflation in different economies, both comparing similarities but also contrasting differences, with a special emphasis on the factors that enable the US to achieve disinflation while also having a stronger economic activity relative to its peers. I will then conclude with some comments on the US economic outlook and the implications for monetary policy as well. So it's starting with the similarities. Uh, in the early 2020, a uh, worldwide pandemic disrupted the global economy, as you all well remember, and ultimately caused a surge in, in inflation around the world. Global goods were hobbled, transportation and other aspects of supply chains became entangled, and there were significant shortages in terms of the labor market, all combining to cause a severe imbalance between supply and demand in much of the world. Sharp increases, as you remember, in commodity prices were exacerbated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The result was a global escalation in inflation. And let me just show you a few graphs that I have to present to you. Here, as you can see, the black line in this slide shows a measure of world headline inflation in 26 economies which accounts for about 60% of global GDP. This rose to levels not seen since the 1980s. So you can see here, let's see if the pointer works. There it is, right? 1970s, early 1980s, went down. And this was the first time since that experience in the early 1980s when inflation had gone up this much. Indeed, one of the important contributors to the recent movement in inflation across the world has been food and energy prices. As you know, most of the time, variations uh, in inflation are heavily influenced by food and energy prices, which tend to be more volatile than the prices in other goods. And that's the next slide. So here, non-core inflation, which shows these prices, really went up once again 
relative to what it had gone up during the 1970s and 1980s. Because many food and energy commodities are traded internationally, retail prices paid by consumers also tend to have some degree of global synchronization as well. So in the previous slide, this component here captured the global component, which has been estimated by Federal Reserve researchers by a dynamic factor model to estimate the common component of inflation across these 26 economies that I mentioned before. And this blue line, this is headline inflation, right, shows that this global component accounts for much of the rise in headline inflation. Surprisingly, right, you see the exact same thing, this yellow line, this global component also captures much of the rise in this non-core inflation, these food and energy prices that I mentioned before. So this black line shows this rise in food and energy inflation based by consumers around the world, but this yellow line shows this global component, which shows how global components can really indicate a high degree of synchronization and captures much of the rise in food and energy prices during this period as well. But at the same time, on the right-hand side, you see core inflation. Core inflation excludes this very volatile component of food and energy prices. So another thing that has been uh, quite surprising about this period is that the escalation of inflation has been widely diffused across different price categories. This core inflation, as I said, excludes food and energy prices, but it includes categories which are much more exposed to domestic conditions, such as housing and medical services. Yet, as shown by both the black line here and by the red line, which captures the global component, the recent rise in core inflation showed a high degree of global synchronization as well, even though much of these captures domestic conditions such as housing and medical services. So this has been a surprising and new development. Looking back in history, in fact, this is the first time since the 1970s here when this global component has been as important in explaining this core component. Moreover, this rise in core inflation in the US and in more advanced economies shows that there was a widespread rise across the whole range of categories in the core basket as well. So it wasn't just those housing and medical services, but a whole set of components within the consumption basket. Academics, um, policymakers have debated about the possible explanations of this recent rise and this recent commitment of inflation around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic was a global phenomenon that had effects on both supply and demand that were similar across countries. On the supply side, you probably all will remember that businesses closed affecting goods production and the provision of services as well. There were labor shortages due to illnesses, to social distancing, to early retirements, and to declines in immigration. With all these factors, making it harder to produce goods and services. Production disruptions and labor shortages propagated around the world due to the long and intricate supply chains that had been forged over several decades of growing globalization in trade. So in balance, both supply and demand widen as consumers switch their spending from services to goods, straining transportation capacity that further disrupted supply chains. This reallocation of demand from services to goods also strained the ability of firms to produce as they struggle to find qualified workers due to the needed reallocation of workers across sectors. This demand was also likely fueled by the fiscal response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and 2021. All of these factors drove up costs, and there were others, of course, 
As I mentioned before, Russia's war in Ukraine intensified the increase in, in energy and in food commodity prices during the recovery from the pandemic as well. And the interaction of these different forces also likely played a role. So for example, as Asia increased production to meet higher demand for goods in the US, these probably drove up wages and other input costs in Asia, increasing demand in turn for imports from other parts of the world and raising costs there too. So there was kind of a chain reaction that happened during that period. My assessment is that both supply and demand contributed to the recent global inflationary episode, including in the US, with international trade of goods, including commodities and services, playing an important role in disseminating these forces throughout the world. One salient aspect of the past inflationary episode is the observation that core inflation, which typically falls more slowly than it increases. So in fact, I'm gonna show you slide four because here we can see in the red lines World core inflation rising more quickly than it decreased in the three most recent episodes of significant inflation and disinflation. The left-hand side panel shows the period from 72 to 78. The middle panel shows the period from 78 to 86. And this latest period, this most recent bout of inflation and disinflation goes from the end of 2020 to the first quarter of 2024. And what you can see here is that core inflation rises much more quickly than it actually decreases. The decrease is much slower. In these episodes, escalation of four quarter inflation increased by an average in fact of seven tenths of a percentage point per quarter to its peak. So that's what I just showed here, this increases show more or less seven tenths of a percentage point per quarter, while the decrease in these three latest episodes shows a decrease of about three tenths of a percentage point per quarter to the trough. Still, it is important that central bankers do not compare only similarities across economies in the recent inflation fight, but that we also contrast differences, notably, Another important feature of the last three inflation and disinflation periods is that through this, is that uh, the share of core inflation explained by the common component increases when inflation rises. This share actually shrinks uh, when inflation falls, as can be seen by the three panels on the slide again here. So if you look at here in this panel, the increase is much faster. This global component becomes less important when inflation is falling. This suggests that while the reasons underlying the commitment of inflation across the world, such as global supply disruptions and commodity price shocks, may have been important when prices were increasing, the evidence indicates that factors vary more from economy to economy when the disinflationary period starts. So idiosyncratic factors start to become more important. Economic researchers have raised several possible explanations for why the disinflationary trajectories experienced by different economies during this post-pandemic period uh, has occurred. For example, some point to differences in the magnitude of demand and supply imbalances, driven by the shutdown and reopening of each economy with this imbalance probably being more important in the Euro area than in the US. While noting that differences in the size of the fiscal stimulus in different countries were also likely important, the fiscal stimulus in different countries were likely important in that they were different in terms of the targeting of the stimulus. So in some cases, there was a greater emphasis on addressing supply disruptions, and that was the case in the US. Global factors also affect various economies differently, with studies showing that the exposures to fluctuations on commodity prices are an important issue. For instance, in Europe, and you know that well here in Germany, 
Europe was heavily affected by natural gas shortages related to Russia's war in Ukraine, while gas supplies in the U.S. were more plentiful during this period. Also, supply, change, uh, supply chains were untangled at different speeds in different parts of the world, with, for instance, low water levels in the Panama Canal and attacks in the Red Sea by Houthi rebels affecting different shipping routes differently around the world. This is even after the Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And last but not least, differences in labor market tightness were likely playing a different role in different parts of the world, with evidence pointing to its importance in the U.S. in driving up nominal wage growth, a fact that also likely helped keep employment and economic activity at healthy levels. Research at the Board of Governors have also found differences in the pace of disinflation across countries, which have been largely driven by different trajectories of services price inflation. Let me show you slide five, where we can see that. They find that the dispersion of inflation across countries peaked in early 2023, and that has been declining ever since. So here's headline inflation, peaking in early 2023, and declining since then. But this was not so much for core services. So you have core goods being this dotted line, the green dotted line, and then core services, which kept increasing until later and only started declining slowly um, much more recently. Other cross-country research suggests that wage developments helped explain services inflation dynamics. Indeed, services inflation from both the U.S. and the euro area have been elevated. Still, while U.S. housing services inflation has been running much higher than the wage-driven non-housing component, the reverse is actually true here in Europe. While the cross-country differences during the recent bout of high inflation have emerged more prominently during the disinflationary period, economic growth has been very heterogeneous since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Generally speaking, the U.S. has experienced a significantly stronger recovery than other advanced economies. As we can see in the left panel of slide six, you can see that this has been the case in, in case of total GDP, much higher recovery in terms of GDP in the U.S. relative to the euro area, which is the red line. Uh, but this is also a case in the other, in the largest components of GDP, in particular consumption and investment in the middle and right-hand side panel. You can see the big recovery in the U.S. in terms of final consumption and that big difference relative to Europe, and likewise in terms of investment, where there has been a big recovery in the U.S and less of a recovery in Europe as well. In explaining why the U.S. has managed to bring down inflation and experience at the same time a strong economic activity, I believe that the combination of restrictive monetary policy together with convex supply curves can partly explain these developments. In addition, I want to point to three supply-related factors that I think have made a significant contribution to the combination of rapid disinflation together with continued resilient growth in the U.S. So let me turn to the first one. First, there have been important factors that have affected total factor productivity differently across countries as reflected by the rate of new business formation shown in the left panel of slide seven. So here, you see that in the US, there was a slight reduction in business incorporations during the pandemic, but only a small one, and it rose very sharply in 2021, staying at that very high level throughout. In Europe, by contrast, you saw a sharp decline in incorporations right here. That recovered, but it stayed pretty much where it was before. So that opened a gap in terms of business formation 
in the two continents. This is important because while most new firms fail, a small share of those that survive grow rapidly and make significant contributions to aggregate productivity, as I have found in my previous research. Moreover, the pandemic era business creation surge has been particularly strong in high tech sectors during this recent bout of entrepreneurship. This includes computer system designs as well as research and development services as well. And this reflects in higher growth in total factor productivity in the US relative to other advanced economies as shown by the right panel here. This right panel shows TFP growth in the US. It's also pretty healthy in Europe, but this contrast, for example, with Canada and the UK where TFP has been a lot lower. In addition to these changes in entrepreneurship and business creation, which certainly seem to be contributing to TFP growth, I would point to artificial intelligence and the adoption of artificial intelligence. So while AI technology is still in its nascency, US businesses across different sectors of the economy are investing in and adopting AI. According to the Business Trends and Outlook Survey, or BTOS, of the census, more than 20% of companies in 15 sectors across the US have adopted AI already. It may be too early to tell, but additional productivity gains may be coming from tasks that are enhanced by AI to process improvements. So the second factor that I think has contributed to this disinflation and help to keep employment and economic activity at healthy levels is labor productivity. We have seen a stronger rate of labor productivity growth in the US as shown in this left panel in slide eight. The economic policy response to the pandemic in the US was robust, but it was different from the response in many other advanced economies. And that seems to have driven <coughs> a higher increase in labor productivity. So the green area is output per hour for labor productivity. And as you can see, this contribution to total GDP growth is much greater in the US than it is in the Euro area. There is some growth in the UK and none in Canada. So in other economies, the emphasis has been certainly on maintaining employment. So the so-called worker retention schemes here in Europe, for example, have allowed firms to keep workers employed during this pandemic period and have certainly been very helpful in maintaining job losses low and maintaining unemployment low. In fact, unemployment peaked several times higher in the US. As you can see here, this is unemployment rate in the US speaking much higher compared to Europe during that period of the pandemic. And that helped to keep workers out of the woods and maintain them during that period of the pandemic. By contrast, in the US, the strategy was to use unemployment insurance and to maintain workers and help workers through those periods of unemployment. This obviously minimized Euro area job losses but it may have limited the flow of workers to more productive sectors of the economy, which is supported by the Fed's research showing substantially more sectoral reallocation of workers in the US compared to the Euro area. So that's the last panel. So yes, a lot higher unemployment and job losses in the US, but also much more sectoral reallocation happening in the US compared to the Euro area especially during the pandemic, but also beyond the pandemic, in the post-pandemic period. And that really helped to also increase productivity. It increased the quality of matching in the US economy. Third, are you, uh, the, the third factor that I want to point in terms of contributing to this disinflation and a healthy economic outlook is that the US labor supply grew a whole lot during the post-pandemic period. Labor force participation rate 
uh, increased solidly during this post-pandemic period, especially beginning in 2021 through the middle of 2023. And in particular, the U.S. population increases strongly because of high levels of immigration. So here you see net immigration in 22 and 23 in Canada, where it was very healthy, a lot of immigration coming into Canada, in Germany as well, in the UK, and also in the US. In fact, in the US, it was a little bit lower, but it's still very healthy compared to where it came from. Recent immigration flows into some European countries like Germany and the UK, like I just showed, have definitely been comparable in terms of a proportion of those uh, that we find in the US. Uh, and that is seen by that, that panel on the left-hand side. But as shown by the right-hand side, this right-hand side shows the employment rate of refugees after several years of being in this receiving country, right? That level of participation in the labor force and in particular the level of employment of refugees and immigrants in the labor force tends to be higher even from day one when they arrive to the country. This is work by Christian Dosman and co-authors that shows that that increase is probably more in places like Germany and the UK over time, but it's higher from the onset, from the very beginning in the US and it stays higher throughout after immigrants remain from five to 10 years on in the receiving country. So this means that new immigrants may have contributed relatively more to US growth because they seem to integrate more quickly into the labor force in the US compared to some European countries. So finally, I'm turning to our focus to monetary policy. This is stronger economic performance with falling immigration has allowed the FOMC to be patient in terms of the timing of reducing the policy rate. The performance has given us time to strongly focus on the inflation side of our mandate. And this, together with the bump in the, earlier in the year that we saw in terms of inflation, helps explain why we began easing monetary policy to less restrictive levels only after other central banks in advanced economies, such as here in the EU, had done so. But now, as you know, the combination of significant ongoing progress in reducing inflation and a cooling in the labor market means that the time has come to begin is in monetary policy. And I certainly strongly supported the decision by the FOMC in our September meeting to cut the rate by 50 basis points. Looking ahead, I believe the focus should remain on continuing to bring inflation down to 2%. I support, but at the same time, I support shifting attention to the maximum employment side of the FOMC's dual mandate. The labor market remains resilient, but I support a balanced approach to the FOMC's dual mandate so we can continue making progress on inflation while avoiding undesirable slowdowns in terms of employment growth and, and an economic expansion. If progress on inflation continues as I expect, I will support additional cuts in the federal funds rate moving forward until we get to a neutral policy stance. Still, my approach to any policy decision will continue to be data dependent and to rely on multiple and diverse sources of data to form my view of how the economy is evolving. For instance, I am closely monitoring the economic effects from Hurricane Helene and from geopolitical events in the Middle East, since this could affect the economic outlook and possibly even the inflation side of our mandate. If downside risks to employment escalate, it may be appropriate to move policy more quickly to a neutral stance. So maybe continue with those 50 basis points cut. But alternatively, if incoming data do not provide confidence that inflation is moving sustainably towards 2%, it may be appropriate to slow normalization in the policy rate. As I have described, the escalation of inflation unleashed 
by the pandemic was global in scope, and the fight to reduce inflation has also been global. Each of our economies faces its own unique mixture of challenges, but by comparing similarities and also differences, I believe we can learn a lot from each other's experiences. In conclusion, let me thank those of you in the room who contribute all the time to bridging science and practice. For those working on the policy side, thank you for your hard work because you help us analyze the economic data that allows us policymakers to make decisions, but also consumers and businesses that can gain a better understanding of ongoing developments in the global economy. And on the academic side, because I know there are many academics here in the room, I want to thank you for your creativity and ingenuity in asking policy relevant questions and pushing the boundaries of our understanding of an ever changing economic landscape, because that's what we need, again, to be able to make the right policy decisions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adriana. This was uh, so fascinating. Uh, excellent speech. Uh, I, I think you you showed quite uh, convincingly that uh, the higher business dynamism uh, in the U.S. and also the higher flexibility, including of the labor market, may be one um, main determinant of the higher productivity growth as well. So I, I think that was uh, quite interesting. So. Um, you mentioned, I mean, I mentioned, you mentioned data dependency in your speech. And uh, of course, sometimes uh, the data um, uh, move uh, in one or the other direction. And then we talk about the famous bumps and so on. And we had one of those bumps last Friday. So uh, uh, if, you, if you can, I mean, it would be great uh, to hear what you make out of that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that question, Isabel. So you're right that I think, as we all know here in the room, we have to smooth through the noise and we have to smooth through the ups and downs in the data. We're always looking at the trends and I think that's very important. Obviously, um, the very healthy levels of job creation, the lower unemployment that we saw in Friday's jobs report is, is very welcome. We don't want a drastic slowdown in the labor market. That's exactly what we were trying to avoid when we decided to do a 50 basis points cut because we had seen a few months of cooling. But it wasn't just a few months of cooling. I want to remind people, right, that again, we're looking through the trends. We're looking at 2021, there were 700,000 jobs created per month in that year. 500,000 jobs per month created in 2022. 300,000 jobs created in 2023. That has slowed during the past year to 200,000, and in the past six months to 166,000. So again, we, we kind of smooth through the data. I don't think we can look at any particular month and take too much from that. What we're looking is at trends. The cooling has certainly started to take hold in the labor market in the US. And again, we look at the whole constellation of data. We not only look at the unemployment rate, we not only look at job creation, we look at the whole constellation of data. So if you look at the VU ratio, that's back to where it was pre-pandemic at 1.2. If you look at hiring and quits rate, those are back around where they were pre-pandemic. So there's several metrics that point to the labor market cooling to a level where we're back to pre-pandemic levels. And that's why we're thinking, well, the labor market is certainly resilient. As you mentioned in my speech just a month ago, I, I talk about the really stellar um, you know, performance of the labor market over the past few years, the 30 months of job creation, continuous job creation and law unemployment below 4% um, that we saw just until last year. But at the same time, we don't want that labor market to weaken so much that it's going to start on the pain, when at the same time, what we have been seeing is a serious reduction in terms of inflation and this inflation that is moving back to target. 
And so we're kind of weighing all factors, not making too, too much out of one month's data, but looking at general trends and certainly looking at many different economic metrics and metrics in the labor market. Yeah, th thank you so much. I mean, you may remember that President Lagarde had this distinction between data dependency and data point uh, dependency. And it's sometimes, see, I mean, we are data dependent, the Fed, the, the uh, ECB and other major central banks, but it sometimes seems that markets are very data point dependent, which then leads to these right. kind of big, big swings. So let me open the floor for questions from uh, the audience. Yes, please. Good morning, Carlo Boffa from Politico Europe. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you showed uh, um, a chart about uh, the refugees and how many can get into employment uh, uh, into different countries, US, UK, and Germany. Just want to ask you if you can explain a little bit that chart, like why do you think in the US are, uh, they, they can find a job much, much easier than, for example, in Germany? Uh, is it just a question of language? Is it a question of more investments? And maybe a bit more generally, if I can ask, what do you think it's the uh, long-term effect of, inf of, of immigration on inflation? Do you still think it's, um, it averages out? Or do you think it, it can be something that lowers inflation in the long term? Thank you. Yeah, great questions. Thank you. So in terms of the assimilation, I think it has to do with the types of visas that they come into the country with but it has to do with the sectors they're going into. So in the US, most of these workers are employed in construction, employed maybe in services, and that doesn't necessarily require uh, knowledge of the language. So they, they tend to be assimilated pretty quickly. Uh, plus there are all those new businesses that are creating jobs and they need to work, new workers to also maintain um, their activities. And, and many of those may be even minority-owned businesses, where they need to hire somebody that, that doesn't necessarily speak English, but they, they can speak other languages and, and be assimilated pretty quickly. So that, that's part of it. In the long term, in terms of the long-term effects, I think that's still to be determined. I think there are two effects, right? There's the supply effect. They help to ease the supply side disruptions, this lack of workers that we had, this really drastic reduction that we had, people withdrawing out of the labor force in mass. They help to bridge that and to close that gap. At the same time, some of these immigrants are also consumers. So you're right that there are kind of two effects that could be going into opposite directions. Um, they consume, they create businesses. Some of them down the road end up creating businesses, as, as I mentioned before. Uh, and then some of them need housing, right? So far, I have to say that the research that has been done at the Fed, for example, doesn't show any effect on housing prices. Contrary to Canada, for example, where that, that has really created a spike in housing prices. Um, in terms of consumption, certainly it's, it seems to be more one-to-one, -one, maybe less than one-to-one, -one, until we see that some of this immigration may be permanent. There won't be that increase in investment to meet the increase in supply of workers. So it may not be quite one-to-one -one yet. It may become one-to-one -one if that immigration seems to be more permanent, which does not seem to be the case. At least, you, you know, there was a, a decrease in flows through the border in the last few months because of the executive order. So that seems to have slowed a little bit in recent months. And so, as I said, I think it's not quite one-to-one, -one, which means that it's not creating inflationary pressures, but it's relieving so far uh, inflationary pressures by creating additional supply of workers, especially in construction, where it helps in terms of the housing market and housing construction, in terms of services, where housing X services has been a big factor, kind of not aligned as to make greater progress on this inflation. So in those sectors, that supply of immigrant workers really helps. Thank you very much. Another question right here. Hi, thank you. Um, Francisca Marone, I'm from the ECB. Um, I just wanted to ask, so basically you, 
I think outlined quite well the differences a bit between the US now and, and the global experience, especially in, in the coming down of the inflation. So I just wondered whether you could maybe elaborate a bit more on also what you kind of what lessons you draw from this, especially like for the coming policy cycle um, as, as you continue fighting inflation also in the US. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So the, this research that the staff at the Fed has done identifying this global component is, is really impressive and, and quite important. But as I said, that, that contributed mainly as inflation was going up. It seems to contribute in less as inflation is coming down. Uh, and as I pointed in the speech, there are some critical differences between Europe and the US. In the US, it is core or ser in particular services inflation that has been very key, and more specifically, housing inflation. So housing inflation is contributing a lot in the US. Uh, services ex housing to some extent too, because of the high wages, but that's starting to moderate, so that's less important. So it's that housing component that is, is really kind of causing a lot of troubles for us because that this inflation is a lot slower in terms of housing. Um, I'm paying attention to specific factors. So we just had a big hurricane, Hurricane Helene, which may cause, as I mentioned, some downward risk to economic activity. Uh, I'm paying attention to other local factors, for example, the Boeing uh, strike, may cause some job losses as well and some reduction in employment uh, during the next few months. So we, we all have to be paying attention to specific factors that may slow us down as well. But, but you know, just understand that some of these are bumps on the road. There may be payback down the road, right? Like you have a slowdown for a month and then that employment comes back up. So we have to smooth again through, through the noise to some extent. Thank you very much. We are already eating into the coffee break, but I have two more questions, and I would like to take them uh, one after the other. So here and there, uh, and then you, you respond jointly to the two questions Perfect. so that people get their well-deserved coffee. Okay. Hello, I'm Paola Di Casola from the ECB. Thanks for a very interesting presentation, especially on the global factors behind uh, the inflationary process. I wanted to ask you, what do you think will be the role of monetary policy now that uh, global factors are less important for the upcoming uh, disinflationary process? Let's take the other question immediately. So I'm Leo Fontaden here from the ECB. First of all, thanks a lot really for this great presentation, the way you guided us through the data, bringing us to the current juncture and offering views about how to go forward. Very, very helpful. My question is a simple one. In your consideration, what role does the dual mandate play? And in particular, in the last strategy review of the Fed, you know, the employment treatment received an asymmetric touch, right? Uh, and whether this is, will be under, re under review for your next strategy review. So, I mean, the idea is that unemployment spells require maybe more patience, while when you see an overheating, then you would, t I mean, you will react more forcefully. So is this something that, you know, will, will be revisited in the next review of, the, of your strategy? So let me, let me answer to the two questions. I think your question about monetary policy and the role of monetary policy is very critical. Um, I would say that even though we have started to ease, both on our end and on your end here, uh, we do have to acknowledge that monetary policy is still restrictive. And, and because of lags, but also because of the disinflation, right, causing real rates to continue to go up, that means that the level of restrictiveness still remains, right? There is, we're, we don't know exactly where the neutral rate, but we do know that we're way above the neutral rate. So, our restrictiveness and our stance is still slowing economic activity, and so that will continue to work its way through and to help us definitely uh, reduce and continue to, to achieve this inflation and move towards the two percent target. So I don't, I don't expect right that even with the with the larger cut that we had, with that front loading that we saw, fifty basis point cut we were kind of all of this sudden removing all level of restriction that, that we have in the economy. Interest rate sensitive sectors are still kind of slow. The housing market is not gonna respond immediately the way one, one would uh, necessarily 
think it would. It, it will take some time for these tanks to make their way through. I was talking about transmission lags with one of the colleagues around here. Those lags take a little bit of time. So it will take some time until we get there. Uh, on the framework, we, we haven't actually had that discussion. We're starting at the end of the year. So that's, that's certainly a discussion we will have. I think the previous framework was, was heavily informed with, with what came from the global financial crisis. Uh, and we have to work on a framework that, that works not only for a short period of time, but a framework that, that encompasses all, all possible situations. So we will definitely be discussing, but um, we haven't had that discussion even inside uh, our building. So, so we'll have to get back to you on that. Thank you so much, Adriana, for an excellent speech, a very open uh, discussion. It was a pleasure to host you here at the ECB. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, for listening. Now it's time for the coffee break. Actually, Philip and I, we will have to move towards the, the board meeting. Unfortunately, we will not be able to, to stay. But thanks again, and uh, let's give a hand to Adriana for her excellent presentation. Thank you.